Peter Augustini. When I arrived at Peter's studio, it was quiet and was more of a storeroom than a working studio. After a while, I realized why. That he was as cooperative as he was surprised me when, after exiting a number of times to a room in the back of the building, I learned he was tending to the needs of his wife who was ill and suggested that maybe we had come at a bad time and he said that it was not a problem. Peter made part of his living early on designing and building mannequins for department stores like Bergdorf Goodman in New York. He was also the designer of the logo identity head of Elsie the Cow for Bordens. Stephen Antonakos. Stephen worked in New York at the time of this portrait and did commissions for huge neon murals all over the world. The last time I was in Denver, I saw one of them that spanned the wall of a building a block long. When we were done shooting, he and his wife invited us to lunch, and that ended the day beautifully. Barbara Bordnick Barbara was one of the photographers that I chose to include in this project who applied their art through the world of commercial photography. She actually made a living from her art and usually a very good one. Barbara was extremely pleasant and cooperative. She knew exactly what to do as a subject from all of the hours she had spent behind the camera. I really liked the light fixture in the portrait. Working with available light, I often include light sources as an environmental element in my portraits. Cornell Kappa. Cornell was the director of the International Center of Photography in New York at the time of this portrait. The round window he is standing in was one of two in his office. After looking all over ICP with him for a good location, he insisted that the round window was his favorite. The window needed washing, so Cornell got some pa water and paper towels and proceeded to clean the window. Then the phone rang. Cornell was trapped on the phone while I cleaned the window under Cornell's direction. At the close of the session, Cornell said, I think you should come back tomorrow and take my portrait in the other window. It needs cleaning, too. Chuck Close. Chuck was reluctant to be photographed as he had not been feeling well and was behind in his work schedule. He, like so many others, was afraid the session would take too much of his time. I assured him the portrait would take no more than a half hour. Chuck said he tried to keep comfort and convenience out of his studio. He got more work done that way. No creature comforts to distract him except for a television so he could keep up on his soaps. He had only recently put in a couple of comfortable chairs. When the sitting was over in only about 25 minutes, Chuck was very surprised. You mean you're not one of those photographers who always says just one more? Well, now that certainly was painless enough, he said, looking quite pleased. I was pleased also, knowing we had two good portraits of Chuck. Roy de Carava when we arrived at Roy's house in Brooklyn, he was not home, so we sat on his steps and waited. Within minutes, a man wheeling a stroller with a little girl in it approached and said, The fishbacks, I presume. We were shown into Roy's living room and invited to look around while he ran upstairs to change his shoes. I picked two spots to work with, one in front of a window and the one pictured in this portrait with Roy standing in the massive wooden doorway while being reflected in a huge mirror. I sat him in the window last. Without prompting, Roy's young daughters climbed up on his lap. I kept on shooting. Th those were the images he was the most interested in. Sandy Fellman Sandy had a great studio in the Bowery. When we arrived for the portrait session, I noticed she had Polaroid's 20 by 24 inch camera in her studio. At that time, select people were allowed to borrow this camera for proposed art projects. We talked about location and she suggested we take a look at her roof. I often invite my subjects to suggest a location or space where they are comfortable. Not only does this help me find an environment they will be at ease in, but the process of looking together involves them in the experience. A portrait is a partnership between the photographer and his subject. Without the subject's involvement, the revealing moment is pretty hard to come by. Most of the photographers I have made portraits of seem to know instinctively what part of their environment will make an interesting composition. Sandy was no exception. Upon reaching the roof,
I discovered it was covered with black tar paper. There were the usual structures to house mechanicals for the building and a few skylights. One of these presented an interesting possibility. Ralph Goings. Ralph attended the California College of Arts and Crafts and later settled in Sacramento, where he taught art in high school. He moved to New York in the late 70s. I found Ralph living and painting in Char Charlottesville in an old farmhouse. His wife ran an antique store out of part of it, and Ralph had his studio in one of the outbuildings where I photographed him. Ralph describes his work as being in two phases, photography and painting. I worked with Ralph the same day as Richard Archfogger, Richard Pettibone, and Nancy Becker. Red Grooms lived nearby, but was away when we were there, or we could have photographed him as well. John Hilton The art director at Weinstock's department store, Douglas Bolins, knowing I was going to New York to photograph artists, got excited and suggested I make a portrait of one of his friends, who was a painter there. At first I did his portrait out of duty to the commercial client that helped to fund the trip to New York. John proved to be well worth photographing in his own right. Andre Cortez. We made contact with Andre through his curator, Susan Harder. Andre's was one of the names I heard growing up from my dad. He was one of his favorite photographers. I photographed Andre sitting on his couch and on his balcony where he made a series of images of Washington Square for a book using a Polaroid camera. For the portrait on the couch, I asked if I could remove one of the drawings on the wall to make a clean background behind him. He told me that he wanted at least one to remain as his wife had done the drawings. I only made seven exposures during this session. When I was done, Andre exclaimed, Finally, a photographer who knows what he is doing. Last week, Life magazine was here and they exposed roll upon roll until I could not stand it any more and ordered them from my house. He introduced me to all of his staff as the photographer who knows what he is doing and insisted on walking us out and hailing us a cab so we could return to our hotel. Andre was 88 at the time of this portrait. Max Kozlov. Max led us into his apartment where he and his wife lived and worked. There was very little art or other artifact to work with as environments, so I chose the dining room table to sit him behind mainly because of the play of light. The geometry was interesting and simple and afforded me a place with wonderful light to photograph him. Just as I started to shoot, his cat, Nosy, jumped up on the table and began to perform, so I swung the camera slightly to the right to include the cat. Cats have gotten into my portraits a number of times in the Artist Portrait series. Ironically, most of the cats are usually camera shy, I have been told. It has been an honor that they trusted me. Jay Mizell. Jay owned a 100-year-old bank building in the Bowery. We met him in front and followed him in as he swept a sleeping drunk off the stoop. He looked at a number of locations, but none seemed quite right. John Lowengard, the then picture editor of Life magazine, arrived while we were looking and suggested we check out the basement. Obviously, I found the perfect environment to work with. Jay stores all of his color transparencies in the vault and claims it is very, is perfect for humidity and temperature control as well as being fireproof. I did, in addition, make one image with Jay in front of one of his quintessential panoramic mural shots of the New York skyline. Important to note, Jay had a heavyweight punching bag just inside the front door to his studio. He said he punched it for about 30 minutes every morning before going to work. He claimed it prepare him for working in New York City. Robert Mapplethorpe Robert was one of the most gracious subjects I have ever photographed. After a short session, which went very smoothly, he asked us if we would like to see what he was working on. Of course we said yes. One of his assistants brought out a stack of 100 prints of images he had made of Lisa Lyons, the then world champion women's bodybuilder, in preparation for the book Lady. We spent the afternoon with Robert looking at prints and drinking coffee. Occasionally we were interrupted by one of his assistants asking for Robert's approval of a wet print in a tray. Others 
did his printing for him near the space where we talked there was a bed in a niche in the wall surrounded by a wall of chicken wire nailed to two by four studs painted black a few years later i had an exhibition of artist portraits at the michael himovitz gallery in sacramento california the theme was a portrait hung next to one of the artist's works when i called robert he suggested i call his dealer in new york when i did they immediately complied and sent me a print for the show barbara morgan we were greeted warmly when we arrived at Barbara's house in Scarsdale, New York, and led into her kitchen where we had tea and cookies. After all, a good grandmother has to have cookies on hand at all times, she said. She had several grandchildren who visited her often. It was Barbara's husband, Willard, who talked her into becoming a photographer. She was a painter who had always thought photography was too easy and felt that using a camera would be like cheating. One day she tried it and was an immediate convert and found that photography wasn't really all that easy. Barbara was 82 when I photographed her and she had just begun a campaign against anything nuclear. She wanted to know there would be a beautiful world left for her grandchildren to grow up in. We noticed time was getting late and asked to use her phone to get a cab so we could catch our train back to New York. She said, nonsense, I'll take you to the station. We piled ourselves and our equipment in her VW bug and she got us there with time to spare. Ursula Snyder Ursula's work, large and segmented, was a natural to place her with. All I had to do with the top portrait of her was to place her between two of the paintings. The other portrait was all about light and we both collaborated on this idea as there was a photo flood on a light stand sitting pretty much where it is in this portrait. All I had to do was turn it on and place her to take advantage of its presence. 